Hello guys, welcome to a new chapter of the future of humanity. This is going to be chapter 5. Mars, the Garden Planet. In the 2015 movie The Martian, the astronaut played by Matt Damon faces the ultimate challenge. To survive alone on a frozen, desolate and airless planet, accidentally left behind by his fellow crewmates, he has only enough supplies to last a few days. He must summon all of his courage and know-how to last until a rescue mission can reach him. The movie was realistic enough to give the public a taste of the difficulties Martian colonists would encounter. For one, there are the fierce dust storms, which engulf the planet with a fine red dust that resembles talcum powder and almost tipped over the spacecraft in the movie. The atmosphere is almost entirely made of carbon dioxide and the atmospheric pressure is only 1% that of the Earth, so an astronaut will suffocate within a few minutes if exposed to the thin Martian air, and his blood will begin to boil. To produce enough oxygen to breathe, Matt Damon has to create a chemical reaction in his pressurized space station, and since he's rapidly running out of food, he has to grow his own plants in an artificial garden. To fertilize the crops, he has to use his own waste. Bit by bit, the astronaut in the Martian takes the excruciating steps necessary to create an ecosystem on Mars that is capable of sustaining him. The movie helped to capture the imagination of a new generation, but the fascination with Mars actually has a long and interesting history that stretches back to the 19th century. In 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli Notice strange linear markings on Mars that seem to be formed by natural processes. He called the markings canali, or channels. However, when the Italian was translated into English, the I was dropped and the term became canals, which has an entirely different meaning. The artificial, not natural. A simple mistranslation gave way to an avalanche of speculation and fantasy, sparking the man from Mars myth. The wealthy and eccentric astronomer Percival Lowell began to theorize that Mars was a dying planet and that the Martians had dug the canals in a desperate attempt to transport water from the polar ice caps to irrigate their scorched fields. Lowell would dedicate his life to probing his conjecture, using his considerable private fortune to build a state-of-the-art observatory in Flagstaff in the Arizona desert. He never did prove the existence of these canals, and years later, space probes would show that the canals were an optical illusion. But the Lowell Observatory scored successes in other areas, contributing to the discovery of Pluto and providing the first indication that the universe was expanding. In 1897, H. G. Wells wrote The War of the Worlds. The Martian in the novel a plan to annihilate humanity and terraform the Earth so that its climate becomes like that of Mars. The book gave rise to a new literary genre. You could call it the Mars attack genre, and the idle esoteric discussions of professional astronomers suddenly became a matter of survival for the human race. On the day of before Halloween in 1938, Orson Welles took excerpts from the novel to create a series of short, dramatic, realistic radio broadcasts. The program was presented as if the Earth was actually being invaded by hostile Martians. Some people began to panic hearing updates on the invasion, and about how the armed forces had been overwhelmed by death rays, and how the Martians were converging on New York City in giant tripods. Rumors from terrified listeners spread rapidly across the country. In the aftermath of this chaos, the major media vowed never again to broadcast a hoax as if it were real. This ban continues until today. Many people were caught up in Martian hysteria. The young Carl Sagan was enthralled by novels about Mars, such as the John Carter of Mars series. In 1912, Edgar Rees Burroughs, famous for his Tarzan novels, dabbled in science fiction by writing about an American soldier during the Civil War who was transported to Mars. Burroughs speculated that John Carter would welcome a Superman because of the low gravity on Mars relative to Earth. He will be able to jump incredible distances and outfight the aliens, thanks to uh, the beautiful Deja Thoris. Cultural historians believe that this explanation for the superpowers of John Carter are actually real.
Taking up residence on Mars sounds romantic in science fiction, but the realities are quite daunting. One strategy for prospering on the planet is to take advantage of what is available such as ice. Since Mars is frozen solid, all you will have to do is dig a few feet until you hit the permafrost. Then you could excavate the ice, melt it and purify it for drinking water or extracting oxygen for breathing and hydrogen for heating and rocket fuel. For protection against radiation and dust storms, colonists might have to dig into the rock to build an underground shelter. Because the atmosphere of Mars is so thin and its magnetic field is so weak, radiation from space is not absorbed or deflected as it is on Earth, so this is a real problem. Or it could be advantageous to set up the first Martian base in a gigantic lava tube near a volcano, as we discussed doing on the Moon. Given the prevalence of volcanoes on Mars, it is likely such tubes will be plentiful. A day on Mars is roughly the same duration as a day on Earth. The tilt of Mars with respect to the Sun is also the same as Earth's. But settlers will have to get used to the gravity on Mars, which is only 40% of the gravity on Earth. And as on the Moon, they will have to exercise vigorously to avoid muscle and bone loss. They will also need to contend with the brutality of the cold weather and will be in a constant struggle to avoid freezing to death. The temperature on Mars rarely exceeds the freezing point of water, and after the sun goes down, it can plunge to as low as minus 127 degrees Celsius. So any power failure or blackout could prove life-threatening. Even if we can send the first manned mission to Mars by 2030, because of these obstacles, it might take until 2050 or beyond to compile sufficient equipment and supplies to create a permanent outpost on the planet. Because of the vital importance of exercise to prevent muscle deterioration, astronauts on Mars will necessarily have to engage in vigorous sports, where they will find, much to their delight, that they have superhuman abilities. But this also means that the sport arenas will have to be completely redesigned. Because the gravity on Mars is a little bit more than one-third the gravity on Earth, a person can in principle jump three times higher on Mars. A person would also be able to throw a ball three times farther on Mars, so basketball courts, baseball diamonds and football fields will have to be enlarged. Furthermore, the atmospheric pressure on Mars is about 1% that of the Earth, meaning that the aerodynamics of baseballs and football balls are drastically modified. The main complication is the precise control of the ball. On Earth, athletes are paid millions of dollars because of their uncanny ability to control the motion of a ball, which takes years of practice. This skill has to do with their ability to manipulate the ball's spin. When a ball moves through the air, it creates turbulence in its wake, a small eddy currents that cause the ball to swerve slightly and slow down. Football players throw the ball so that it spirals rapidly in the air. Spinning reduces the eddy currents on the ball's surface, so it can more accurately slice through the air and travel much further without tumbling. Also, because it is spinning rapidly, it is like a small gyroscope, and hence points steadily in one direction, which keeps the football moving in the correct path and making it easier to catch. Using the physics of airflow, it is possible to show that many of the myths concerning a baseball are true. For generations, baseball pitchers have claimed that they can throw knuckle balls and curve balls, which allows them to control the ball trajectory, seemingly in violation of common sense. Time-lapse videos show that this is correct. If a baseball is thrown so that it has minimal spin, like in a knuckleball, turbulence is maximized and the ball's path becomes erratic. If a baseball is spinning rapidly, then the air pressure on one side of the ball can be greater than the pressure on the other side, and hence the ball will swerve in a certain way. All this means that for world-class athletes from Earth, the reduced air pressure on Mars may cause them to lose their ability to control the ball, so that an entire new crop of Martian athletes may rise in their place. Mastery of a sport on Earth may mean little when applied to Mars. If we draw up a list of the sports that are found in the Olympics, we see that without exception each and every one will have to be modified to take into account the reduced gravity and air pressure on Mars. In fact, a new Martian Olympics may emerge, including radical sports that are not physically possible on Earth and don't even exist yet. The conditions on Mars may also increase the artistry and elegance of other sports. A figure skater, for example, can only spin about four times in the air on the Earth. No skater has ever performed a quintuple jump. This is because the height of the jump is determined by the velocity at takeoff and the strength of gravity. On Mars, figure skaters will be able to soar three times higher in the air and execute breathtaking jumps and spins because of the reduced gravity and air pressure. Gymnasts on Earth perform marvelous twists and turns in the air because their muscle strength exceeds the weight of their body. But on Mars, their strength will vastly exceed their reduced body weight, allowing them to perform twists and turns in the air that have never seen before. 
One son, our astronauts have mastered the fundamental life and death of challenges of surviving on Mars, they can savor some of the aesthetically pleasing rewards of the red planet. Because of the planet's weak gravity and thin atmosphere and lack of liquid water, Martian mountains can grow to truly majestic proportions compared to earthbound ones. Mars Olympus Mons is the largest known volcano in the solar system. It is about 2.5 times taller than Mount Everest and so wide that if placed on North America, it would extend from New York City to Montreal, Canada. The low gravity field also means that mountain climbers will not be burdened by heavy backpacks and will be able to perform prodigious feats of endurance like astronauts on the moon. Adjacent to Olympus Mons are three smaller volcanoes in a straight line. The presence and position of these smaller volcanoes are indicative of ancient tectonic activity on Mars. The Hawaiian Islands here on Earth provide a useful analogy. There is a stationary pool of magma under the Pacific Ocean, and as the tectonic plate moves over this magma pool, the pressure from the magma periodically pushes upward through the crust, creating the latest island in the Hawaiian chain. But tectonic activity seems to have ended on Mars long ago, providing evidence that the core of the planet has cooled down. The largest Martian canyon, Marine Air Valley, which is probably the largest canyon in the solar system, is so vast that if placed to North America, it would extend from New York City to Los Angeles. Hikers would have marveled at the Grand Canyon, would be astounded by this extraterrestrial canyon network. But unlike the Grand Canyon, Marine Air Valley does not have a river at the bottom. The latest theory is that the more than 3,000 mile canyon is the juncture of two ancient tectonic plates, like the San Andreas Fault. A prime tourist attraction will be the red planet's two giant polar ice caps, which feature two kinds of ice and differ in composition from those on the Earth. One type of ice cap is made of frozen water. These are a permanent fixture on the landscape and remain roughly the same for much of the Martian year. The other variety consists of dry ice, or frozen carbon dioxide, and they expand or contract depending on the season. In the summer, the dry ice vaporizes and disappears, leaving only the ice caps composed of water. As a result, the appearance of the polar ice caps will vary during the course of the year. Whereas the Earth's surface is continually changing, Mars' basic topography has not altered much in a few billion years. As a result, Mars has featured features that have no counterpart on Earth, including remnants of thousands of giant meteor craters that were formed long ago. The Earth once had giant meteor craters as well, but water erosion erased many of them. Furthermore, most of the surface of the Earth is recycled every few hundred million years due to tectonic activity, so ancient craters have all been transformed into new terrain. Looking at Mars, however, is gazing at a landscape frozen in time. In many ways, we actually know more about the surface of Mars than the surface of the Earth. About three quarters of the Earth is covered by oceans, while Mars has no oceans. Our Mars orbiters have been able to photograph every square meter of its surface and give us detailed maps of its terrain. The combination of ice, snow, dust and sand dunes on Mars creates all sorts of novel geologic information that are not seen on Earth. Walking across the Martian terrain will be a hiker's dream. One apparent hindrance to making Mars a tourist destination might be the monster Dust Devils, which are quite common and can be seen crisscrossing the deserts almost daily. They can be taller than Mount Everest, dwarfing those on Earth, which only rise a few hundred feet into the air. There are also ferocious planet-sized dust storms that can envelop all of Mars in a blanket of sun for weeks, but they will not do much damage thanks to the planet's low atmosphere pressure. 100 mile an hour winds would only feel like a 10 mile an hour breeze to an astronaut. They may be a nuisance, blowing fine particles into our spacesuits, machinery and vehicles, and cause malfunctions and breakdowns, but they're not going to topple buildings or structures. Because the air is so thin, airplanes will need a much larger wingspan to fly on Mars than on Earth. A solar power aircraft will require tremendous surface area and might be too expensive to deploy for recreational purposes. We probably will not see tourists flying through Martian canyons like they do over the Grand Canyon, but balloons and blimps will be a viable means of transportation in spite of the low temperature and low atmospheric pressure. They could explore the Martian terrain at much closer distances than orbiters, yet still cover by areas of the surface. One day fleets of balloons and blimps may be a regular sight over the geologic wonders here. To maintain a lasting presence on the red planet, we must find a way to create a garden of Eden on its inhospitable landscape. 
Robert Subrin, an aerospace engineer who has worked with Martin Marinetta and Lockheed Martin, is also founder of the Mars Society and for years has been one of the most vocal proponents of colonizing the Red Planet. His aim is to convince the public to phone a manned mission. Once he was a lone voice, pleading with anyone who would listen, but now companies and governments are seeking his advice. I have interviewed him on several occasions and each time his enthusiasm, energy and dedication to his mission has shined through. When I asked him what sparked his fascination with space, he told me that it all started with reading science fiction as a child. He also was mesmerized when, as early as 1952, Von Braun showed how a mission of 10 spaceships assembled in orbit could take a crew of 70 astronauts to Mars. I asked Dr. Subrin how his fascination with science fiction translated into a lifelong quest to reach Mars. Actually, it was a Sputnik, he said. To the adult world, it was terrifying, but to me, it was exhilarating. He was captivated by the 1957 launch of the world's first artificial satellite because it meant that the novels he was reading might come true. Science fiction, he firmly believed, would one day become science facts. Dr. Subrin was part of the generation that saw the United States start from scratch to become the greatest spacefaring nation on the planet. Then people began to be consumed by the Vietnam War and internal strife, and walking on the moon seemed increasingly distant and unimportant. Budgets were slashed. Programs were cancelled. Although the public mood turned against the space program, Dr. Subrin maintained his conviction that Mars would be the next milestone or on our agenda. In 1989, President George H. W. Bush briefly excited the public imagination by announcing plans to reach Mars by 2020, until the following year when studies showed that the price tag for the project would be about $450 billion. Americans got stickered uh, shock and the Mars mission was shelved once again. Subrin spent years wandering in the wilderness, trying to drum up support for his ambitious agenda, acknowledging that the public would not support any scheme that has over budget. Sobrin proposed a number of novel but realistic approaches to colonizing the Red Planet. Before he came along, most people did not seriously consider the problem of financing future space missions. In his 1990 proposal, called Mars Direct, Subrin reduced costs by splitting the mission into two parts. Initially, an unmanned rocket called the Earth Return Vehicle is sent to Mars. It carries a small amount of hydrogen, only about 8 tons, but combines it with the unlimited supply of carbon dioxide that occurs naturally in the Martian atmosphere. This chemical reaction produces up to 112 tons of methane and oxygen and provides enough rocket fuel for the subsequent return voyage. Once the fuel has been generated, astronauts take off in a second vehicle called the Mars Habitat Unit, which contains enough fuel for a one-way trip to Mars. After the astronauts land, they conduct scientific experiments, then they leave the Mars Habitat Unit and transfer it into the Earth return vehicle from the original mission, which is loaded with the newly created rocket fuel. This ship will then bring them back to Earth. Critics are sometimes horrified to hear that Subrin advocated giving travelers a one-way ticket to Mars, as if expecting them to die on the Red Planet. He's careful to explain that the fuel for the return trip can be manufactured on Mars. But he adds, life is a one-way trip, and one way to spend it is by going to Mars and starting a new branch of human civilization here. He believes that 500 years from now, historians may not remember all the petty wars and conflicts of the 21st century, but humanity will celebrate the founding of its new community on Mars. NASA has since adopted aspects of the Mars Direct strategy, which changed the philosophy of the Mars program to prioritize cost and efficiency and living off the land. Subrin Mars Society has also constructed a prototype of an actual Mars base. They chose Utah as the site for their Mars Desert Research Station because the environment came closest to simulating the conditions on the Red Planet. Cold, deserted, barren and lacking in vegetation and animals, the core of the MDRS is its habitat, a two-story cylindrical building that can house seven crew members. There is also a large observatory for stargazing. The MDRS takes volunteers from the public who commit to a two to three week stay at the station. The volunteers are trained to behave as actual astronauts with certain obligations and duties, such as conducting science experiments, performing maintenance and making observations. The organizers of the, the MDRS try to make the experience as realistic as possible and use these sessions as a way to test the psychological dimension of being isolated on Mars for extended periods with relative strangers. More than 1,000 people have passed through the program since it began in 2001. 
The lure of Mars is so strong that it has attracted several ventures of questionable value. The MDRS should not be confused with the Mars One program, which advertises a dubious one-way trip to Mars for those who pass a sequence of tests. Though hundreds have applied, the program has no concrete means of getting to Mars. It claims that it will pay for its rocket by soliciting donations and producing a movie about its mission. A skeptics charge that the leaders of the Mars One program are better at conning the press than attracting genuine scientific expertise. Another outlandish attempt to form an isolated colony like one we will create on Mars was a project called Biosphere 2, bankrolled by $150 million from the Bass family fortune. A three-acre dome complex made of glass and steel was erected in the Arizona desert. It could house eight humans and 3,000 plants and animal species and was meant to serve as a seal habitat to test whether humans could survive in a controlled, isolated environment that resembles that what we might they call another planet. From its start in 1991, the experiment was plagued with a series of mishaps, disputes, scandals and malfunctions that hardly generated uh, more science than headlines in the press. Fortunately, these facilities were taken over by the University of Arizona in 2011 and since then they have become a valid research center. Based on his experience with MDRS and other efforts, Dr. Subrin predicts that the colonization of Mars will proceed in a predictable sequence. In his view, the first priority is to establish a base for around 20 to 50 astronauts on the surface of Mars. Some will stay for only a few months, others will become lifers and make the base their permanent home. Over time, the people on Mars will start to see themselves less as astronauts and more as settlers. Most supplies would initially have to come from Earth. But in the second phase, the population will rise to a few thousand people, and they will become capable of exploiting the raw materials of the planet. The red color of the suns on Mars is due to the presence of iron oxide, or rust, so settlers will be able to make iron and steel for construction. Electricity can be generated from large solar parks harvesting energy from the sun. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere could be used to cultivate plants. The Mars settlement will gradually become self-sufficient and sustainable. The next step is the most difficult of all. Ultimately, the colony will have to find a way to slowly heat the atmosphere so that liquid water can flow on the red planet for the first time in 3 billion years. This will make agriculture and eventually cities possible. At that point, we will enter the third stage, and a new civilization could flourish on Mars. Rough calculations suggest that it may be prohibitively expensive at present to terraform Mars and that it will may take centuries to complete the process. However, what is intriguing and promising about the planet is the geographic evidence that liquid water was once abundant on the surface. Etching riverbeds, riverbanks and even the outline of an ancient ocean the size of the United States. Billions of years ago, Mars cooled down before the Earth did and had a tropical climate when the Earth was still molten. This combination of mild weather and large bodies of water has led to some scientists speculating that DNA originated on Mars. In this scenario, a giant meteor impact blasted tremendous amounts of debris into outer space some of it later landing on Earth and seeding it with Martian DNA. If this theory is correct, then all you have to do is to, lo to look at a Martian is to look in the mirror. Sobrin points out that terraforming Mars is not a new or a strange process. After all, the DNA molecule is continually terraforming the Earth. Life has reshaped every aspect of the Earth's ecology, from the composition of the atmosphere to the Earth's topography, to the makeup of the oceans, so we will simply be following nature's own script when we begin to terraform Mars. To initiate the process of terraforming, we might inject methane and water vapor into the atmosphere to induce an artificial greenhouse effect. These greenhouse gases will capture sunlight and steadily raise the temperature of the ice caps. As the ice caps melt, they will release trapped water vapor and carbon dioxide. We might also send satellites into orbit around Mars to direct concentrated sunlight onto the ice caps. The satellites could be synchronized to hover over a fixed point in the sky and direct energy to the polar regions. On Earth, we angle our satellite TV dishes towards a similar geostationary satellite about 22,000 miles away that appears to be fixed in the sky. In this scheme, these Martian solar satellites will turn four gigantic sheets, many miles across, containing a vast array of mirrors or solar panels. The sunlight can 
either be focused and then aimed towards the ice caps or the energy could be converted using solar cells and then sent down as microwaves. This is one of the most efficient, albeit costly, approaches to terraforming, because it is safe, non-polluting and ensures minimal damage to the surface of Mars. There have been other proposed strategies. We could consider mining methane-rich Titan, one of the moons of Saturn, and bringing the methane to Mars. The methane will contribute to the desired greenhouse effect. Methane, for reference, is over 20 times more efficient at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. Another possible method is to make use of nearby comets or asteroids. As we have discussed, comets are largely composed of ice, and asteroids are known to contain ammonia, a greenhouse gas. If they happen to pass Mars, they can be deflected slightly so that their orbits uh, are around the planet. Then they can be further redirected until they execute a very slow death spiral towards Mars. As they enter the Martian atmosphere, friction hit the, hits them up until they disintegrate, releasing water vapor or ammonia. This trajectory will be a significant sight from the surface of Mars. In some sense, NASA's asteroid redirect mission can be thought of a practice run for such an undertaking. The ARM, you recall, is a fu future NASA mission to either retrieve rock samples from or gently alter the trajectory of a comet or asteroid. Of course, this technology has to be fine-tuned or we risk deflecting a giant asteroid onto the surface of Mars and wrecking havoc on a colony. A more unorthodox idea suggested by Elon Musk is to melt the ice caps by detonating hydrogen bombs high above them. This method is currently possible with off-the-shelf technology. In principle, hydrogen bombs, although highly protected, are relatively inexpensive to manufacture and we certainly have the technology to drop scores of them onto the ice caps with existing rockets. However, no one knows how stable the ice caps are or what the long-term effects of this procedure might be and many scientists are uncertain about the risk of unintended consequences. It is estimated that if the ice caps of Mars were completely melted, there would be enough liquid water to fill a planetary ocean 15 to 30 feet deep. This proposes all endeavor to bring the Martian atmosphere to a tipping point where the warning will be become self-sustaining. Raising the temperature by 6 degrees Celsius will be sufficient to instigate the melting process. The greenhouse gases emitted from the ice caps will heat the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide absorbed into the desert eons ago will also be released and contribute to planetary warming, causing further melting. Thus, the heating of Mars will continue without further intervention from the outside. The warmer the planet, the more water vapor and greenhouse gases are released, which in turn warms the planet even more. This process could carry on almost indefinitely and would increase Mars's atmospheric pressure. Once liquid water starts to flow within the ancient riverbeds of Mars, settlers could begin to large-scale agriculture, plants love carbon dioxide, so the first outdoor crops might be raised, and their waste products could be used to generate a layer of topsoil. Another positive feedback loop will be initiated. More crops could produce more soil, which could be used to nurture additional crops. The native soil of Mars also contains valuable nutrients such as magnesium, sodium, potassium and chlorine that will help plants succeed. As plants begin to proliferate, they will also generate oxygen, an essential ingredient for terraforming Mars. Scientists have created greenhouses that simulate the harsh conditions on Mars to see if plants and bacteria can survive there. In 2014, NASA's Institute for Advanced Concepts partnered with TechShot to construct biodomes with control environments in which to grow oxygen producing cyanobacteria and algae. Preliminary tests indicate that certain life forms can indeed flourish there. In 2012, scientists at the Mars Simulation Laboratory, maintained by the German Aerospace Center, found that lichen, which is similar to moss, could survive there for at least a month. In 2015, scientists at the University of Arkansas showed that four species of methanogens, microorganisms that produce methane, can survive in a habitat resembling the Martian ecology. Even more ambitious is NASA's Mars Ecopiosis Testbed, a project that aims to send hardy bacteria and plants, such as extremophile photosynthetic algae and cyanobacteria to Mars and aboard a rover. These life forms will be placed in canisters that will be drilled down into the Martian soil. Water will be added to the canisters and then instruments will look for the presence of oxygen, which would indicate active photosynthesis. If this experiment is successful, Mars one day may be covered with farms of this kind to generate oxygen at food. 
By the beginning of the 22nd century, the technologies of the fourth wave, nanotech, biotech and AI, should be mature enough to have a profound impact on the terraforming of Mars. Some biologists have posited that genetic engineering may result in a new species of algae that is designed to exist on Mars, perhaps in the particular chemical mix of its soil or its newly formed lakes. This algae could will thrive in the cold, thin carbon dioxide rich atmosphere and release copious quantities of oxygen as a waste product. It will be edible and could, could be bioengineered to mimic flavors found on Earth. In addition, it will be engineered to produce an ideal fertilizer. In the movie Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, a fantastic new technology called the Genesis device was introduced. It was capable of terraforming dead planets into lush, livable worlds almost instantly. It would explode like a bomb and release a spray of highly bioengineered DNA. As this super DNA spreads to all corners of the planet, the cells will take root and dense jungles will form until the whole planet was terraformed within a matter of days. In 2016, Claudius Gross, a professor at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, published a paper in the Journal of Astrophysics and Space Science detailing what a real-life Genesis device might look like. He predicts that a primitive version will be possible in 50 to 100 years. First, scientists on Earth will have to carefully analyze the ecology of the lifeless planet. The temperature, soil, chemistry and atmosphere will determine which types of DNA should be introduced. Then, fleets of robotic drones will be sent to the planet to deposit millions of nano-sized descent capsules carrying an array of DNA. When these capsules release their contents, the DNA engineered precisely to thrive in the planet's environmental conditions will latch onto the soil and begin to germinate. The contents of these capsules are designed to reproduce by creating seeds and spores on the barren planet and use the minerals found there to create vegetation. Dr. Gross believes that life on the newly seeded planet will have to develop the old-fashioned way, by evolution. He warns that global-scale ecological disasters might occur if we try to rush this process, especially if one type of life form ends up proliferating so rapidly that it pushes out the others. If we succeed in terraforming Mars, what it is to prevent it from reverting back to its original barren state? Investigating this issue brings us to the back uh, to the critical question. Why did Venus, Earth and Mars evolve so differently? When the solar system was formed, the three planets were similar in many ways. They had volcanic activity, which released large quantities of carbon dioxide, water vapor and other gases into their atmosphere. The water vapor condensed into clouds and the rain helped to carve out the rivers and lakes. If they had been closer to the sun, the oce their oceans would have boiled away, and if they were farther out, their oceans would have frozen. But all three were within or very close to the Goldilocks zone, the, the band around a star that allows water to remain in liquid form. Liquid water is the universal solvent out of which the first organic chemicals materialized. Venus and the Earth are almost identical in size. They are celestial twins and by rights they should have followed the same evolutionary history. Science fiction writers once envisioned Venus as a verdant world that would make a perfect vacation spot for wary astronauts. In the 1930s, Edgar Rice Burroughs introduced another interplanetary swashbuckler, Carson Napier in Pirates of Venus, which described the planet as a jungle-like wonderland full of adventure and danger. But today, scientists realize that Venus and Mars do not resemble the Earth at all. Something happened billions of years ago that sent these three planets on very distinct paths. In 1961, when the romantic notion of a Venusian utopia still dominated the public imagination, Carl Sagan made the controversial conjecture that Venus suffered from a runaway greenhouse effect and was devilishly hot. His novel and disturbing theory was that carbon dioxide acts as a one-way street for sunlight. Light can readily enter through the carbon dioxide in Venus' atmosphere because the gas is transparent, but once the light bounces off the ground it turns into heat or infrared radiation which cannot easily escape the atmosphere. The radiation becomes trapped in a process similar to the way a greenhouse captures sunlight during the winter or the way cars heat up in the summer sun. This process happens on the Earth, but it is vastly accelerated on Venus because it is much closer to the Sun, and a runaway greenhouse effect was the result. 
Sagan was proven correct the next year when the Mariner 2 probe flew past Venus and revealed something truly shocking. The temperature was a blistering 900 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt tin, lead and sink. Instead of being a tropical paradise, Venus was a hellhole resembling a blast furnace. Subsequent space shots confirmed the bad news, and there was no relief when it rained because the rains consist of caustic sulfuric acid. Considering that Venus is linked to the Greek goddess of love and beauty, it is ironic that this sulfuric acid, which is highly reflective, is the reason why Venus shines so brightly in the night sky. In addition, the atmospheric pressure of Venus was found to be almost 100 times that of Earth. The greenhouse effect helps to explain why. Most of the carbon dioxide on the Earth is recycled, dissolving in the oceans or in the rocks. But on Venus, the temperature became so high that the oceans boiled off and instead of dissolving in rocks, the gas was baked out of them. The more carbon dioxide out gas from the rocks, the hotter the planet got, setting off a feedback loop. Due to the planet's high atmospheric pressure, being on the surface of Venus is equivalent to being 3000 feet below the surface of Earth's oceans. You could be crushed like an eggshell, but if you could find a way to overcome this and the searing temperatures, you would still be confronted with a scene from Dante's Inferno. The air is so dense that when walking on the surface, you will have the sensation of walking through molasses, and the ground under your feet will feel soft and squishy because it is made of molten metal. The acid rains will eat through the tiniest tear in your spacesuit, and one false move and you might sink into a bath of molten magma. Given these constraints, terraforming Venus seems out of the question. If our t twin Venus turned off differently because it was closer to the Sun, how do we explain the evolution of Mars? The key is that Mars is not only farther from the Sun, but it is also much smaller and therefore cooled off faster than the Earth. Its core is no longer molten, planetary magnetic fields are generated by the motion of metal with a liquid core, creating electrical currents. Since the core of Mars is made of solid rock, it cannot create an appreciable magnetic field. In addition, it is believed that heavy meteor bombardment three or so billion years ago triggered so much chaos that the original magnetic field was disrupted. This may explain why Mars lost its atmosphere and water. Without a magnetic field to protect it against harmful solar rays and flares, the atmosphere was gradually blown out into outer space by the solar wind. As the atmospheric pressure would drop, the oceans boiled away. Another process accelerated the loss of its atmosphere. Much of the original carbon dioxide on Mars dissolved into the oceans and turned into carbon compounds, which subsequently were deposited on the ocean floor. The tonic activity on the Earth periodically recycles the continents, and the carbon dioxide is allowed to rise to the surface again. But because the core of Mars is probably solid, it has no significant tectonic activity, and its carbon dioxide was locked into the ground permanently. As carbon dioxide levels began to drop, a reverse greenhouse effect took place and the planet went into a deep freeze. The dramatic contrast between Mars and Venus can help us appreciate the Earth's geologic history. The core of the Earth could have cooled down billions of years ago, but it is still molten, because unlike the Martian core, it contains highly radioactive materials like uranium and thorium with half lives of billions of years. Whenever we are faced with the awesome power of a volcanic explosion or the devastation caused by a massive earthquake, we are encountering a demonstration of how the energy of the Earth's radioactive core drives events on the surface and helps to sustain life. The heat generated by radioactivity deep inside the Earth causes the iron core to churn and produce a magnetic field. This field protects the atmosphere from the solar wind and deflects deadly radiation from space. The Earth is larger than Mars and so it did not have to cool down as quickly. The Earth also did not suffer a collapse of its magnetic field caused by giant meteor impacts. We can now revisit our earlier question about how to keep Mars from returning to its prior state after it has been terraformed. One ambitious method is to artificially generate a magnetic field around Mars. To do this we will have to place huge superconducting coils around the Martian equator. Using the laws of electromagnetism, we can calculate the amount of energy and materials necessary to produce this band of superconductors, but such a tremendous undertaking is beyond our capabilities in this century. Settlers on Mars, however, would not necessarily regard this threat as an urgent problem. The terraform atmosphere could remain relatively safe for a century or even longer, so adjustments may be able 
uh, to be done slightly and slowly over the centuries. The upkeep might be a nuisance but will be a small price to pay for humanity's new outpost in space. Terraforming Mars is a primary goal for the 22nd century, but scientists are looking beyond Mars as well. The most exciting prospects may be the moons of the gas giants, including Europa, a moon of Jupiter, and Titan, a moon of Saturn. The moons of gas giants were once thought to be barren hunks of rock that were all alike, but they are now seen as a unique wonderlands, each with its own array of geysers, oceans, canyons, and atmospheric lights. These moons are now being eyed as future habitats for human life.